Hey, it's Brian, back again for part two of this Burr Month's bonus special storytime miniseries where Ricky Meese of the Sleigh Bells and Mistletoe Christmas podcast narrates the 1916 story When the Yule Log Burns by Leona Dalrymple. If you're listening in real time, this miniseries is being released on four consecutive days starting on Thursday, December 12th. And you really do need to listen from the beginning to follow along. And also, you really do need to subscribe to Sleigh Bells and Mistletoe for more Christmas fun for the season and beyond. Again, in this miniseries, we'll skip the announcements and the wrap-ups. We'll just get right to the story. So, to remind you, last time we left off, John and Ellen were disappointed that their adult children wouldn't be returning from the city for an old-fashioned country Christmas. But the couple invited Roger and Margaret, a brother and sister from their community, to come to their house. Roger and Margaret wouldn't have had a very merry or special Christmas on their own because life had dealt them a couple of bad cards. So everyone was just getting cozy by the fire on Christmas Eve, making wishes on the Yule Log. And then, as the clock struck 7.30, John and Ellen decided to go on a sleigh ride before their Christmas Eve masquerade party began. Did you know that Christmas masquerade parties were once very common? Maybe they should make a comeback. Or did you know about the game of Snapdragon, or the notion of a Christmas King, or leaving out a bunch of Christmas oats for the birds? Lots of new stuff to discover in this next installment, in addition to the continuing storyline of the gathering at John and Ellen's house, and the many surprises in store for that evening. So if you're ready, kick off those fuzzy slippers and cozy up in your favorite flannel pajamas and slip into the story world of Christmas past. As Ricky Meese narrates the second installment, of As the Yule Log Burns by Leona Dalrymple. By the Fire How it was that the old doctor somehow lost his way on roads he had traveled since boyhood was a matter of exceeding mystery and annoyance to Aunt Ellen. But lose it he did. By the time he found it and jogged frantically back home, the old house was already a swarm with masked mysterious guest, and old Asher with a lantern was peering excitedly up the road. Holly-trimmed sleighs full of merry neighbors in disguise were dashing gaily up, and in the midst of all the excitement, the doctor miraculously discovered his own mask and Aunt Ellen's in the pocket of his great coat. So hospitable Aunt Ellen, considerably perturbed that so many of her guests had arrived in her absence, an absence carefully planned by the doctor, betook herself to the masquerade. And the Christmas party began with bandits and minstrels and jesters and all sorts of queer folk flitting gaily about the house. They paid gallant court to Roger in his great chair by the fire and presently began to present for his approval an impromptu mummer's play. And now the lights were all out, and a masked and courtly old gentleman in satin breeches was standing in the bright firelight, pouring brandy into a giant bowl of raisins. Now he was gallantly bowing to Roger himself, who was plainly expected to assist with a lighted match. He did this with trembling fingers and eyes so big and black and eloquent. The doctor cleared his throat as the leaping flames from the snapdragon bowl flashed weirdly over the bizarre company in the shadows. Roger, eagerly watching them snatch the raisins from the fire, fell to trembling in an ecstasy of delight. Presently, a slender arm of a crimson sleeve, whose wearer was never very far from Roger's chair, slipped quietly about his shoulders and held him very tight. So an endless round of Merry Christmas games lasted until deep and mellow came the last of the majestic boom of the grandfather's clock striking twelve, and with it, a hearty cheer of Christmas greetings. As the doctor, smiling significantly down into Roger's excited eyes, gave the signal to unmask. By the fire, a mysterious little knot of guests had been silently gathering, and now as Aunt Ellen Leslie removed her mask, hand and mask halted in midair, as if fixed by the stare of Medusa, and the face above the brown gold brocade flamed crimson. For here, in Puritan garb, was John Leslie Jr. and his radiant wife, and Philip and Howard, smiling Quakers, and Anne and Margaret and Ellen with a trio of husbands, and beyond a laughing jester in cap and bells whose dark handsome face 
was a little too reckless and tired about the eyes, Roger thought. For a really happy Christmas guest, it was young Dr. Ralph. As Aunt Ellen's startled eyes swept slowly from the smiling faces of her children to the proud and chuckling doctor who had spent heaven knows how many dollars in telegraphed commands, she laughed a little and cried a little and then mingled the two so queerly that she needs must wipe her eyes and catch a Roger's chair for support, whereupon a kindly little hand slipped suddenly into hers and Roger looked up and smiled serenely. Don't cry, Aunt Ellen, he begged shyly. I knew all about it too, and the doctor, he did it all. And Mary Fitz, he gave us all by telegram too, mother, exclaimed Philip with a grin. Moreover, broke in John, patting his mother's shoulder, there are 11 kids packed away upstairs like sardines. We hid them away while dad and you were lost, and... But here, with a deafening racket, the stairs door burst wide open, and with a swoop and a scream, eleven pajama-clad young bandits with starry eyes bore down upon Aunt Ellen and the doctor. Great Scott! exclaimed John, thoroughly scandalized. You disgraceful kids! Which one of you stirred this up? But the guilty face at the tail of the romping procession was the face of old Asher. Radiantly triumph, the old doctor swung little John Leslie III to his shoulder and faced his laughing family. And as old Annie appeared with a steaming tray, he seized a mug of cider and held it high aloft. To the ruddy warmth of the Christmas log and the Christmas home spirit, he cried, to the home-keeping hearts of the countryside. Gentlemen, I give you a country home and a country Christmas. May more good folk come to know them. And little John Leslie cried hoarsely, Hooray, Grandpop, hooray for a country Christmas. Carelessly alive to the merry spirit of the night, the jester presently adjusted a flute, which hung from his shoulder by a scarlet cord, and lazily piping a Christmas air, wandered into another room to come suddenly upon a forgotten playmate of his boyhood days. It, it, it can't be, he reflected in a startled interest. It surely can't be Madge Hildreth. But Madge Hildreth, it surely was, spreading the satin folds of the grandmother's crimson gown in mocking courtesy. Moreover, it was not the awkward, elfish little gypsy who had tormented his debonair boyhood with her shy, ardent worship of himself and his daring exploits, but instead a winsome vision of Christmas color and Christmas cheer, holly red of cheek, with flashes of scarlet holly in her night black hair, and eyes whose unfathomable dusk reflected no single hint of that old wild worship slumbering still in the girl's rebellious heart. And the symbolism of this stunning makeup, queried Ralph after a while, lazily admiring. The girl's eyes flashed. Tonight, if you please, she said. I am the spirit of the old-fashioned Christmas who dwells in the holly heart of the evergreen wood, a country Christmas, ruddy-cheeked and cheerful and rugged like the winter holly, simple and old-fashioned and hallowed with memories like this bright soft crimson gown. Well, she had been a fanciful youngster too, Dr. Ralph remembered, always passionately a quiver with a wild sylvan poetry and overfond book lore like her father mischievously glancing at a spray of mistletoe above the girl's dark head, he stepped forward with the careless gallantry that had won him many a kindly glance from pretty eyes, and was strangely to fail him now, for at the look in Madge's calm eyes, he drew back, stammering. I, I beg your pardon, said Dr. Ralph. Later, as he stood thoughtfully by his bedroom window, Staring at the wind-beaten elms, he found himself repeating Madge's words. Yes, she was right. Had he not often heard his father say that the Christmas season epitomized all the rugged sympathy and hardiness and health of the country year? Tonight, the blazing Yule log, his mother's face, how white her hair was growing, thought Dr. Ralph with a sudden tightening of his throat. All of these memories had strummed forgotten and finer chords, and darkly foiling the homely brightness came the picture of rushing, overstrung, bundle-laden city crowds of shop girls, white and weary, of store heaps of cedar and holly sapped by electric glare. Rush and strain and worry, 
yes, and a spirit of grudging. How unlike the Christmas peace of this white wind world outside his window. So Dr. Ralph went to bed with a sigh and a shrug to listen while the sleety boughs tapping his windows roused ghostly phantoms of his boyhood. Falling asleep, he dreamt that pretty Madge had lightly waved a Christmas wand of crimson above his head and dispelled his weariness and discontent. Embers And in the morning, there was the royal glitter of a Christmas ice storm to bring boyhood memories crowding again, boughs sheathed in crystal armor, and the old barn roof ablaze with ice. Yes, Ralph thrilled, and there were the Christmas bunches of oats on the fences and trees and the roof of the barn. How well he remembered, for the old doctor loved this Christmas custom too and never forgot the Christmas birds. And today, why of course, there would be double allowances of food for the cattle and horses, for old Toby the cat and Rover the dog. Hadn't Ralph once performed this cherished and beloved Christmas task himself? But now, clamoring madly at his door, was a romping swarm of youngsters eager to show Uncle Ralph the Christmas tree, which, though he had helped to trim it the night before, he inspected in great surprise. And here in his chair by another Yule log, he found Roger staring wide-eyed at the glittering tree with his thin arms full of Christmas gifts. Near him was Sister Madge, whose black eyes, Ralph saw with approval, were very soft and gentle. And beyond in the coffee fragrant dining room, Aunt Ellen and old Annie conspired together over a mammoth breakfast table decked with holly. Oh, John dear, Ralph heard his mother say as the doctor came in. I've always said that Christmas is a mother's day. Wasn't the first Christmas a mother's Christmas and the very first tree a mother's tree? And then the doctor's scandalized retort, now, now, you see here, Mother Ellen, it's a Father's Day, too. Don't you forget that. And so on to the Christmas twilight through a day of romping youngsters and blazing yule logs of Christmas gifts and Christmas greetings, of a haunting shame for Dr. Ralph at the memory of the wild Christmas he had planned to spend with Griffin and Edwards. With the coming of the broad shadows, which lay among the stiff fringed spruces like iris velvet, Dr. Ralph's nieces and nephews went flying out to help old Asher feed the stock. By the quiet fire, the doctor beckoned Ralph. Suppose, my boy, he said, suppose you take a look at the little lad's leg here. I've sometimes wondered what you'd think of it. Coloring a little at his father's deferential tone, Ralph turned the stocking back from the pitiful shrunken limb and bent over it his dark face keen and grave. And now with the surgeon uppermost, Roger fancied Dr. Ralph's handsome eyes were nothing like so tired. Save for the crackle of the fire and the tick of the great clock, there was silence in the firelit room. And presently Roger caught something in Dr. Ralph's thoughtful face that made his heart leap wildly. An operation, said the young doctor suddenly, and halted, meeting his father's eyes significantly. You are sure, insisted the old doctor slowly. In my day, it was impossible, quite impossible. Times change, said the younger man. I have performed such an operation successfully myself. I feel confident, sir, but... But then Roger had caught his hand now with a sob that echoed wildly through the quiet room. Oh, Dr. Ralph, he blurted with blazing, agonizing eyes. You can't mean, sir, that... I'll walk and run like other boys and, and climb the Cedar King. His voice broke in a passionate fit of weeping. Yes, said Dr. Ralph huskily. I mean just that. Dad and I, little man, we're going to do what we can. By the window, Sister Madge buried her face in her hands. Come, come now, Sister Madge, said the doctor's kindly voice a little later. You've cried enough, lass. Roger's fretting about you, and Dr. Ralph here, well, well, he says he's going to take you for a little sleigh ride if you'll honor him by going. Outside, a Christmas moon rode high above a sparkling ice-bright world as the sleigh shot away into its quiet glory. Ralph, meeting the dark, tear-bright eyes of Sister Madge, tucked the robes closer about her with a hand that shook a little. Gypsy Hildreth, he said suddenly, smiling, but the hated nickname tonight was almost a caress. Tell me, Ralph's voice was very grave. 
You've been sewing? Mother spoke of it. There was nothing else, said Sister Madge. I couldn't leave Roger. And now Mother wants you to stay on with her? You'll do that? Well, she is very lonely, said Madge uncertainly. And Ralph bit his lip. Mother? Lonely? he said. She didn't tell me that. Roger is wild to stay, went on Madge, looking away, but I, oh, I fear it is only their wonderful kindness. Still, there's the doctor's rheumatism, and he does need someone to keep his books. Rheumatism, said Ralph sharply. Yes, nodded Madge in surprise. Didn't you know? He's been pretty bad this winter. He's been thinking some of breaking in young Dr. Price to take part of his practice now, and perhaps all of it later. Price, Ralph said indignantly. Oh, that's absurd. Price couldn't possibly swing Dad's work. He's not clever enough. He's the only one there is, said Madge, and Ralph fell silent. All about them lay a glittering moonlit country of peaceful, firelit homes and snowy hills, of long, quiet roads and shadowy trees. And presently, Ralph spoke again. You like all of this, he said abruptly. The quiet, the country, and all of it? Sister Madge's eyes glowed. After all, she said, is it not the only way to live? This scent of the pine, the long white road, the wildfire of the winter sunset, and the wind and the hills, are they not God-made messages of mystery to man? Life among man-made things like your cities seems somehow to exaggerate the importance of man the maker. Life among the God-made hills dwarfs that artificial sense of egotism. It teaches you to marvel at the mystery of creation. Yesterday, when the doctor and I were gathering the Christmas boughs, the holly glade in the forest seemed like some ancient mystic Christmas temple of the Druids, where one might tell his rosary in crimson holly beads and forget the world. Well, perhaps there was something fine and sweet and holy in the country, something, a tranquil simplicity, a hearty ruggedness that city dwellers forfeited in their headlong rush for man-made pleasure. After all, Perhaps the most enduring happiness lay in the heart of these quiet hills. My chief is very keen on country life, said Ralph suddenly. He preaches a lot. Development of home spirit and old-fashioned household gods, that sort of thing. He's an odd sort of chap and a bit too, um, candid at times. He was Dad's old classmate, you know, and Ralph fell silent again, frowning. So Price was to take his father's practice. How it must gall the old doctor. And mother was lonely, huh? And dad's rheumatism getting the best of him? Why, great guns, mother and dad were getting old. And some of those snowy white hairs of theirs had come from worrying over him. John had said so. Ralph's dark face burned in the chill night wind. Well, for all old John's cutting sarcasm, his father still had faith in him. And the trust in young Roger's eloquent eyes had fairly hurt him and then his odd Christmas heart glow. How Griffin and Edwards and the rest of his great friends would mock him for it. Friends! After all, had he any friends in the finer sense of that finest of words? Such warm-hearted, loyal friends, for instance, as these neighbors of his father's, who had been dropping in all day with a hearty smile and a Christmas handshake? And black-eyed Sister Madge, this brave little fighting gypsy poet here. Ralph frowned again and looked away. And even when the cheerful lights of home glimmered through the trees, he was still thinking after an impetuous burst of confidence of Sister Madge. So later, when Dr. Ralph entered his father's study, his chin was very determined. I was ashamed to tell you this morning, sir, he said steadily, but... I'm no longer on the staff of St. Michael's. My hand was shaking and, uh, well, and the chief knew why. And Dad, he faced the old doctor squarely, I'm coming back home to keep your practice out of Price's full hands. You've always wanted that, and my chief has preached it too, though I couldn't see it somehow until today. And presently, sir, when my hand is steadier, I'm going to make that little chap walk and run. I've promised Sister Madge and the old doctor cleared his throat and gulped, and finally he wiped his glasses and walked away to the window, for of all things God could give him. Oh, Grandpop, cried little John Leslie the third, bolting into the study in great excitement. 
Come see Roger. We kids have made him the Christmas King, and he's got a crown of holly and a wand, and he's tapping us this way with it to make us knights. And I'm the fir tree knight, and Bob, he's a cedar king, and Ned's a spruce, and Roger, he says his pretty sister tells him stories like that, smarter than any in the books. Oh, do hurry, Grandpop. The old doctor held out his hand to his son. Well, Dr. Ralph, he said huskily, suppose we go tell mother. So while the doctor told Aunt Ellen, Ralph bent his knee to this excited Christmas king enthroned in the heart of the fire shadows. Rise, said Roger radiantly, tapping him with the cedar wand. I dub thee first of all my knights, the good, kind Christmas night. And here, said Ralph smiling, Here's Sister Madge. What grand title now shall we give to her? But as Sister Madge knelt before him, with firelit shadows dancing in her sweet dark eyes, Roger dropped the wand and buried his face on her shoulder with a little sob. Nothing's good enough for Sister Madge, huh? Broke in the old doctor. Well, sir, I think you're right. Now in the silence, Aunt Ellen spoke, and her words were like a gentle Christmas benediction. Unto us, said Aunt Ellen Leslie, this night a son is given. But by the window, Ralph had not heard, for wakening again in his heart as he stared at the peaceful, moonlit, God-made hills was the old forgotten boyish love for this rugged, simple life of his father's, dwarfing the lure of the city and the mockery of his fashionable friends. And down the lane of years ahead, bright with homely happiness and service to the needs of others, was the dark and winsome face of Sister Madge stirring him to ardent resolution.